sketch make this? Hey everybody, X Sketch back with more Tear in the X Files, and I've already wasted five hours recording and even more desperately trying to edit an unsalvageable video. So instead of wasting your time with explanations of why it's taken over a year to put this video out, let's finally get to season four. Uh, this, though, yeah, this video is not going to do well. You are not going to like this video. I, I will preface this video straight up with a warning you're gonna hate me because i binge watched this and normally season four without question i would put without without re-watching without even thinking about it i would normally put it right up there as the best of the best but it was not a pleasant experience binge watching it and i do not know what it was uh i don't know if it's because you think that, I don't know if it's because of the abduction arc, you feel like the the uh, cancer arc is going to be way longer than it is, but actually you don't get there till like episode 12, 13, 14. Uh, eight of these episodes are directed by Kim Manners, seven by Rob Bowman. So it is technically the most cohesive uh, and, uh, you know, consistent style but as a result, it makes the, the season feel very samey. Now, don't get me wrong. These guys are the best that the show ever had. Uh, but yeah, it can just feel very routine at times. Like I say, some of these episodes are the best the, ever, the series ever put out. But as a binge watch uh, experience, it was just, there's a lot of horror here. There's a lot of lacking uh, variety in the styles. We've got Morgan and Wong back for the, a few episodes, but they're clearly quite bitter and, and just... They're, they're Actually, they're the only ones trying something different. Give them credit where credit is due. Might not necessarily like the episodes, but they're at least trying something different. Uh, but there's no Darren Morgan... And there's, like, only, what, one episode that is really light-hearted? And that's Small Potatoes, which has its own issues. So, yeah, I came away kind of feeling, like, that it was appropriate that the box set is in a red case. Because it felt like, it felt like the most rose-tinted uh, glasses, uh, you know, thought experience of uh a season i i was genuinely shocked and bummed out to be honest um but yeah like i say there are excellent episodes here that are individually amazing uh and uh there's a lot of episodes that surprise you you feel like no nah. and that's what that's the thing i was going through and you would see what one was next and you're like ah. but then you watch it and you enjoy it but like i say it was just it was just as a block experience i just wanted to get that out of the way now because it is going to, I think it's going to show the difference of binge watching versus individual watches regarding the experience of uh, the episodes. Uh, starting out with Heron Volk, the conclusion to season three's cliffhanger Talifakumai, and just decides to do something different because why not? Let's add bees to the mix. Actually, I joke. The the bees were an amazing uh, introduction to the season. Heron Volk itself is important in the Grand Myth arc. At least up until Fight of Future. <laughs> because beyond that, the bees are just forgotten. The black oil is pretty much just forgotten. Uh, I like to call it the Vancouver virus for the fact that its main importance is only... Uh, there during the uh, Vancouver years. Um, but yeah, we continue the chase. The, the alien bounty hunter has turned up to kill Jeremiah Smith. And Mulder, frustratingly, for no reason, after this long, incomprehensible chase through these dark warehouses, you can. The editing is weird. You can barely make out what's going on. And Scully is just randomly wandering around, like, ooh, what's going on? Well, you know, Mulder's running about and the drums are going... Tuk, 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 tuk. Um, Mulder, just leave Scully. It's like, bye! And goes off with Jeremiah Smith. Now I get it. 
he wants Jeremiah to heal his mummy, so he's going to try and protect him at all costs. I get that. That makes sense. But, <laughs> so, the and Bounty, they just leave Scully, who then gets caught by the, the, the alien bounty hunter. And for some reason, she acts, I don't know if she's had a head injury or something, but she acts as if she's never seen this guy before, despite how important, you know, Colony Endgame were. Uh, also, it doesn't make sense because, of course, this is a Chris Carter script, so he doesn't take any cues from previous episodes. Uh, the the inconsistency and lack of continuity regarding... So Mulder stabs the alien bounty, hu bounty hunter in the back of the neck with the plan. Takes the bounty hunter's plan, but leaves the other stiletto uh, embedded in bounty hunter's neck. Now... The green uh, blood does not affect Mulder's eyes. So you're like, okay, Bounty Hunter must be dead. That is that is the logic this show always used, was that if, if the Bounty Hunter was killed, the green blood would not affect you. Or, or one of the other, you know, hybrids. The green blood would not affect you. But if you injured them, the green blood would immediately burn your eyeballs out. But apparently... Apparently that's not the case, and it's possible to just play possum because the bounty hunter just lays there, waits for Scully to come along and check his pulse, and then grabs her in a move exactly the same as the one in End uh, in Colony Endgame. Just kidnaps her, and then uses her as bait to get the information of where Mulder and Jeremiah are, who 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 have sodded off to Canada of all places and I love Canada in this whole season actually Canada is just used as this nebulous place there is no city there is no specific place just oh Canada it's just like um okay and then so so the bounty hunter finds out that they're in Canada and magically teleports there I know, I know you see Mulder and Jeremiah go over this hill and, um, you know, they go to this place where the bees are being used to pollinate these flowers and uh, spread the, the virus, uh, a, a, you know, a, a method that would be later perfected with the crops in Fight the Future. But we see that there are these drones working there. I don't get logic. I must be exceptionally stupid. It's great to see, is it Vanessa Morley back as Samantha? Um, but they've got this other uh, kid as this young Kirk Crawford, who we don't find out is Kirk Crawford uh, until uh, Memento Mori. Um, but <laughs> they have kids working the fields. Why are the adult clones too rebellious wouldn't it be more productive to have adults doing the work than kids am i just being exceptionally dumb there um but yeah they've got these kid versions uh these kid clones and Mulder immediately is like oh my little pet she looks like uh, samantha even though jeremiah said she's not your sister you know the fact that his sister would have aged had she not died spoilers um, but Mulder's like, but she looks like Samantha, so I'm going to keep her. I'm like, okay, Mulder, whatever. Um, but I know they have some time talking about this stuff, and Jeremiah's like, look, I'm just trying to show you the project, what's going on. You can expose it. I don't know how he thinks that's going to happen, especially after he's been working cataloging people at the, uh, the, the government building and stuff. Uh, but then the bounty hunter just turns up out of nowhere. I don't know if he got like an Uber spaceship that came and picked him up and dropped him off in Canada, but he just somehow catches up with him. <laughs> I'm like, wait, what? And don't get me wrong, it's brilliantly directed by Bob Goodwin. There's this amazing uh, chase into this beehive uh, apiary uh, place. Uh, where apparently uh, the actress who plays Samantha, Vanessa Molly, got stung and just carried on like a trooper and didn't... Nobody knew it had happened until after the take. Um, so kudos to her. 
And I don't know if it's because of things like that and the practicality of... They used thousands of bees, but then added CGI ones. And it's really well mixed. It's not super obvious. I love when they have those moments where... And again, I don't know if they're actual bees, but you have like the, the bees up against the, uh, the camera and stuff like that. Uh, it's brilliantly shot. But they knock down this, this wall of bees onto the bounty hunter and you think that he's going to die from being stung, which doesn't make sense because they're carrying the virus that is part of his DNA or whatever. And he, and he just turns up anyway, mildly, like, with stings all over his face. Uh, and then all this lead up of, like, you know, oh, we're going to... and Fine, you're not going to get Jeremiah Smith back. To Washington, no matter how how hard Mulder is going to try, um, but yeah, there's this whole thing of, I mean, without not on screen, you're given the impression that Jeremiah and this Samantha clone have been killed, with just like the the clone that can't speak, <laughs> as the camera pans away, and you're like, okay, <laughs> it's brilliantly shot. It's very thrilling. This episode, which as well uh, brings us the death of X, which I think had to happen. He was so downgraded in season three because of Stephen Williams' shooting schedule with another show. Um, but it feels a little... It's so important. Don't get me wrong. And it would be the... You know, other than Pendrel later this season, it would be the biggest death rid of the last biggest death of the show. Yeah, you could say the syndicate, but who really cared about them? CSM is still about. Um, yeah, it's really the last thing that has any real effect. And of course, you know, he leads us to uh, Marita Covey Rubius and that. Uh, it's fun following, um, we would like to point out as though that it is Scully's fault that X died. Um, she left the tape on the window, so it's all Scully's fault, and we should hold her responsible. <laughs> I love her face off with X, though. It, there's a lot of fun moments in this episode. Uh, it is really important, but I think the problem is, is uh, again, I've watched these all so close together. It's enough. It's not a little green men. As a season opener, I just I'm like. Yeah, it's okay. A lot of important things happen here. I think it's because I have so many issues with it. Like, just thinking about it. You're like, okay, so there was so much lead up of the importance of Jeremiah Smith. And then it just gets thrown away. With not really much, pop, you know, pomp and circumstance. We have this whole thing with Samantha. Where then, when you see Mulder at the end, he's all like, oh... Oh, you know, he's telling Marita that he's had a loss recently. So you're like, oh, oh no, Mom Mulder died. Wow. Wow, that was that was a bit unsudden. Because we don't see her all episode, so, um, except in the hospital. So you got, you're thinking that she's died. And because there was such this emotional moment when he turned up when he didn't have Jeremiah. And Scully's wrapping him up in a towel and stuff. And you're like... Oh, it's so oh bless him, and he's just crying. So then, when you have this, like, however many days, weeks later, you're like, oh no, she died. Oh, that's so tragic. No, apparently he was talking about the Samantha clone because Mom Mulder is still in hospital, and you're like, okay, like, <laughs> okay. I'm sorry, I got so impatient with this episode. I love the scenes of, uh, you know, uh, Scully and Pendrel figuring out this whole thing with the smallpox vaccination scar and taking it to the board. Um, because, you know, Pendrel's the best um, figuring out stuff. Uh, Scully, like I say, versus X, getting the information of the smallpox eradication program uh, cataloging. Um, and there's a lot of excellent set pieces. But you have that, and then you have Bounty Hunter. Again, this is the problem with a show that doesn't have a show bible to at least set down some rules and, and continuity things. But you have Bounty Hunter at the end turn up, and Smoking Burns there, 
and the bounty hunter's like, why should I do this? And 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 smoking man's like, you you know you know we can't have Mulder against us if he's got nothing to lose. We won't talk about Scully, but um, if he's got nothing to lose, then you know he's dangerous, and you know how important Mulder is to the equation. And you're like, ooh, and at the time, amazing tension. You're like, wow, what 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 big part does Mulder have in this grand scheme? And then you watch the rest of the show in hindsight and you're like, okay. I mean, I guess there was the thing with his brain situation. And I guess if, you know, William, but we don't talk about that. I guess, you know, if that had actually been the thing it should have been, um, then I guess that would have been important, but Mulder's just not that important to the... Unless, unless, you know, other than being a needle in their side. Um, he's nowhere near as important to the equation as they make out, you know, mystically in this uh, episode. I think it's just watching it in hindsight. There's a lot of issues in hindsight. At the time, it was riveting. It was thrilling. Um, and as a result, I can't put it low because it is highly enjoyable um i know i've rambled on about this one it's got it's it's just so silly at times i love scully stood there as Mulder and jeremiah disappear and she's like Mulder, and then she, it looks like she actually goes fuck at one point and you're like gets cut off and she's just like Pff. and you're like yeah no she's totally swearing there <laughs> can't believe as usual she got abducted and used it for a bait um yeah it, it's silly at times like that uh i am going to put it you know what on the last two times i've recorded this video because it's just been that much uh i put it in b I won't lie, I'm kind of tempted to put it in A. I, I'm going to get a lot of flack for this. This is a highly rated episode. Um, and again, it is important with what happens to X and then the lead-in for Marita. Uh, and Marita opened so many doors with the scope of the show, uh, which we'll get into. I, I'm going to put it in B. I just, I really struggled with it on this watch-through. I don't know what it was. It just, I don't know, it, 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 it has its moments where you're just sat there going, okay, how much longer we got? <laughs> I can't explain it. I, I cannot explain it. Uh, it just, yeah, it, it, it's well directed. I just think the writing's off. It's not Carter's, it's not Chris Carter's worst writing, uh, but it is missing, uh, I think it's just his lack of, like paying any attention to continuity uh, the fact that it doesn't feel very cohesive watching it back to back with Talitha Kumai because so much just changes it's like two very completely different episodes that are supposed to be part of the same story and I do feel like Jeremiah Smith got shafted and I, I don't know what happened to all the other Jeremiah Smiths were they all bumped off by the bounty hunter we know at least one exists come season 8 but otherwise he just went into the air for for four seasons um so yeah I'm, I'm gonna have to put it there uh i've waffled on about that way too much and you know what when i came into this video i was like no the 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 last time the last version of this video that i tried editing was like two and a quarter hours long i need to push through this and i'm going to but yeah heron Valk is just one of those odd ones that you enjoy but have issues with and I think, again, I think that's so much affected by what came after than necessarily what happened at the time. Because, like I say, the bees, oh, just my favourite thing. And thankfully, you know, we have, sorry, I didn't mean to knock the mic. We have so much with the black oil in this season. Uh, watching that myth arc grow was interesting. Um, but, yeah, I, I feel uh, it's a shame that they were waste, went to waste and stuff like that. Um, but before I waffle on about that anymore, as I normally do, let's get on to home. <laughs> X-Files is the uh, answer to the Chainsaw Massacre. Uh, they were like, you know what? We want to do that, but on TV. And Fox didn't like it. <laughs> this episode 
was the first episode of the show. Uh, and one of few shows uh, at the time to get a, a, a parent, uh, an advisory label. And he got taken out of syndication for the longest time. And that's the funniest thing. Like I say, Kalashari in the UK, 18 rated. This uh, this is just 15 rated. And I, I, I don't know. I feel like this episode is overrated because of how taboo it was uh, dealing with, uh, you know, inbreeding and there's a baby next that gets buried alive. Uh, unfortunately, now I sw I don't know if this got changed at some point. I swear, when I originally watched this, when I, not when I originally watched this, when I watched this through last year for the rewatch, uh, I watched it on Disney Plus, and I swear, I I don't know why, I swear it had the alternate audio where the baby is being buried alive. Now this is it's the original version of the episode that was submitted to Fox, and and it has got a baby crying up until it gets buried, and I could have sworn that the version I watched on Disney Plus had it. But when I went back before recording this to check it's not it's the the second version that has the baby being buried dead which is silly because we later find out when scully autopsies the baby that the baby was alive when it died because it sucked in soil and you're just like uh okay that doesn't add up now it's fine and if you don't know if you don't know that there's an alternate version of the audio with the baby crying, I will not say, I will not lie, watching it with the, I, I watched it back to remind myself with the baby crying audio. And it is super unsettling. Um, but at the same time, it's more realistic, which is more horrifying, which is the point of the episode, uh, from the alternate version which has the baby crying in this way that makes it sound like an alien baby. It sounds like the alien baby in... Oh, my brain is going to go blank. In, like, the, the Dr. Parenti, uh, you know, uh, the... Oh, my God. The uh, 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 existence, uh, essence existence uh, stories. Um... Yeah, it's kind of like that in a way. Uh, but yeah, it's this this episode is really horrifying and terrifying. And I think as I'm pretty sure Kim Manners who di I'm pretty sure it's Kim Manners directed it. Uh, as he said, it's not so much the horror because there's not actually that much. I mean, there's the gore. You see this baby, Mulder Scully autopsy this baby, and it's. Soup, the the doll that they use uh, with this makeup on is pretty gross and horrifying. Uh, looks a little fake, but um, you get what they're going for. Uh, but yeah, it, but there's not much gore. It's all what's implied. And as this show has always been exceptionally good at what it implies horror wise. Um. And apparently a lot of people, this, this, this episode is a Morgan and Wong episode. It was their first episode back. Uh, I think originally this was like episode four in the production list or something. Uh, but it got bumped up, uh, probably to, I don't know, Halloween or something like that. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's Morgan and Wong. And a lot of people are like, did we go too far? And you're like... <laughs> I, as Kim Manor said, what I was saying is Kim Manor said that it's not necessarily the gore or, you know, the inbreeding or stuff like that that people take, that the people are most grossed out by. It's the fact of that idea of somebody under the bed, the monster under the bed that you can't see. And Karen Carnival as the, uh, the mother, Mrs. Peacock, is excellent. I think the, 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 the prosthetics to make her look like a quadriplegic uh, on this little trolley are really well done. Uh, the show was, I said it in the walk. Um, 
I I think this show was always really good with its pro. It's funny that say a season three and season four episode were better at the uh, amputee effect than they were able to do in season five with Kill Switch. Um, but I don't know if that's just David and Covney not properly uh, working with the prosthetics. Um, but that's for another video. Uh, but yeah, the effect of Mrs. Peacock under the, the bed is terrifying. And there's this one shot as Mulder and Scully are walking around the house. And you just have this little light, slit of light on her eyes. Terrifying. Uh, I think Tucker Smallwood is excellent as the sheriff, as this person who quite naive just thinks of his homely town as not remotely dangerous uh and i love the interactions between Mulder and scully as as weird as they are at times they're real like i like the idea that Mulder is completely just like i want to settle down in a place like this if if and i like the way the idea that you know he's like if i had to settle down which makes it sound like it's a chore for him the idea of settling down uh, and the fact that they end up in a place like that is just, uh, you know, even even more fulfilling in, in that kind of way. Uh, and, and Scully's just like, Mona, you're not paying any attention to me. Um, yes, conversation on the bench is beautiful. I love it. It's great, especially in hindsight with stuff that happens. Uh, there's a lot of groundwork there that I think is excellent really well acted really well directed and, and and scripted i do have an issue with Mulder's line scully i never saw you as a mother before uh they've been together four years and yeah i know Mulder's ignorant and stuff like that uh it just felt because scully even looks around at him and it's just like what the fuck <laughs> And you're like, wow, Mulder, well done. You're, she's just she's just been checking you out for your gene, uh, how the state of your gene, family genes and that. And then you had to say something like that. And you can clearly see Scully's frustration through the episode as then they have this scene in the motel room where Mulder's trying to get a signal uh, on the TV and he's moaning that he will not move out to the boonies if, uh, you know, uh, if he can't get the uh, the baseball game or whatever it is. Oh, the basketball game, sorry, I think it's the Knicks game. Um, and then Scully's like, oh, well, you know, it, you know as long as infant side is uh, not going to put you off, then whatever. And it's just like, wow, bitch mode. Uh, I love their interactions, but... And, and they're the only things there to try and add some levity. You know, be it the pushing the pigs and the bar am you and the, is this turning you, uh, you know, is it wrong that this is turning me on, Scully, and, and stuff like that. They're the things there to add levity to this horrific story. Uh, but I'm glad that there's a deleted scene where they're doing the autopsy on the baby and randomly Scully turns round and is like, uh, what? And Mulder's like, oh, it's my pen light. And she's like, oh, I thought a, a long-standing curiosity had finally been, uh, you know, revealed. And you're like, what? <laughs> okay. Now, one, Chris Carter would never have let that go through. Um, but two, as they stood over a dead baby. Yeah, that that's just one step too far. Uh, th there's taking levity and banter. And just being inappropriate. Mulder and Scully are not that inappropriate, especially when it comes to kids. We've seen this time and time again. So, I, you know, it was it was unrealistic that they would be like that in that situation. Uh, so I'm glad it got cut. Uh, I'm sure there are reasons why it got cut, but I'm, I'm glad it was. Uh, I think it's funny that... Uh, um, Johnny Mathis was really against having his song uh, uh, Wonderful Wonderful in, so they had to use a re-recording instead of the original version. Uh, I think it just goes to show, especially, uh, you know, just the understanding, trying to, maybe sometimes trying to explain the, 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 you know, the juxtaposition of, like, this horror and this song, because we know how good Morgan and Wong are at making classic classic 60s wonderful ballads just turn into nightmares <laughs> um uh, and and we have it again later with uh, never again but uh yeah it's it's
it's a really good episode. I really enjoy it. I love the Mulder and Scully interactions, no matter how odd they feel at times, um, in a bid to try and lighten this episode that is very, very dark. Uh, this episode was used as an example of why the V chip should be installed in US TVs. Uh, this had such an impact at the time. Uh, I just feel it's overrated as a result because a lot of people... I don't think... I'm pretty sure this was not broadcast on the BBC originally. It might have been put on extra late. Um, I don't remember watching it on TV originally. I don't think I got to see it until I saw it on VHS. Um, but I could be wrong. Um, but yeah, I don't remember. And certainly when I watched it on... a Quick story... When I got it on DVD, these box sets were about £120 on my mum's catalogue. I would get them for Christmas. Um, and my mum bought season four and I tried watching it. And when it got to the scene where uh, the sheriff gets uh, beat to death, um, the disc kept skipping. So I told my mum. So she said she sent it back to the... the, the um, she said she sent it back to the catalogue and got a new version. Now, I can't remember. I'm pretty sure I did reopen something wrapped in cellophane. Maybe it was because it was Christmas. Uh, she wasn't able to send it back. Uh, no, time-wise. But when I put the new disc in, uh, it too skipped. So I didn't get to see it until I got like the, uh, the, the compact version of the, uh, uh, you know, DVD-wise. <sighs> But yeah, no, this episode, I think it's overrated because of all the hype around it. Um, but it's still an excellent episode. I can't deny it. It's 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 really entertaining. Um, just, I think, I just think it's really well directed and uh, suitably gross and terrifying and really unsettling. I, I, I can understand people's, because of the open ending, I can understand people's desire for the, there to have been a sequel when the revival happened. Uh, and I do think it's odd that they never went back to what happened to Mrs. Peacock and, and one of her sons. Um, but yeah, no, let's, let's be honest. It's, it's a really good episode. And yeah, I'm going to have to put it in S. It's weird because I think it's overrated. Um, but I gotta put it there. I gotta because it's that it's that good and creepy and atmospheric and, and well shot. Um, but anyway, moving on, we got Teleco or Teleco, uh, which is an odd episode um, and is essentially. Uh, was made to to try and uh is basically season four's uh fresh bones or something to to show racial prejudice and stuff but the handling is a little clunky um you have this social worker uh is it cole lumley plays him um you know who's helping this uh samuel boa from africa uh trying to get him a permanent residency in america uh, but it turns out that Samuel Boa, he, uh, he, he, he has this blowpipe thing um, that then helps him take out the pineal gland of other Africans and African Americans uh, that takes out their pigmentation and kills them. And as a pasty white chick i don't know how i can talk about this episode without feeling slightly racially awkward um <laughs> it is the problem is actually you know what this is a genuinely creep, creepy and atmospheric episode but it is essentially a redo of squeeze but with black people <laughs> where a boa escapes detention by somehow squeezing into this uh, food trolley and then he escapes and you're like 
How? And then later they find him in this like little cubby hole. And you're just like, this is just tombs. It's just tombs. And by this point, Mulder and Scully are used to this, but <laughs> I, it, it's sad because there's actually a lot of promise here. And I love, um, I think it's the first time we get to see Marita Kovarubius used in her place at the UN. Uh, because we then have scope, you know, we get to see uh, diplomat, diplomats from, uh, oh my god, where is it, uh, Faso, um, um, is it Burkina Faso, um, I'm pretty sure he's from, so, <laughs> so yeah, we get to see, you know, other countries come into the fold, and, and like I say, we get it later with Tunguska and stuff like that, but we're getting that 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 access to other countries thanks to her position at UN uh and yeah I just I, I genuinely think this is a creepy episode but there are moments where I feel it feeds into you know you have moments with Mulder going oh you know the immigrants nobody cares nobody pays attention you know stuff like that and you're like okay yeah no that's 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 a, a definite unfortunate situation to to bring up feels a little clunky in the way it's delivered but then you have a situation where the social worker goes to a boa's house and he's talking to him and he was saying oh if we get you citizenship then we can bring your whole family over and whoever else you want to and that's that's helpful but at the same time i feel like it i, I don't know to me personally, it just felt like it was feeding into some xenophobia where people were like, oh, it's just to get more people into the country or whatever. I don't know. It, it just felt like it was feeding into that kind of rhetoric. Um, no matter how much it probably wasn't, it, it just felt like it was feeding into people's fears. And it does not help, obviously, that the, the, the African guy is this killer. Now, fine, he's killing other black people but yeah yeah just feel you can't it's so difficult to talk about this episode um because the racial aspect is obviously the center point for it uh but yeah i just i love it, it i don't know what he thought he was doing gonna do by blow darting molder at the end but i love that scene at the end with Mulder and Scully wandering around trying to find him, and then Scully having to, having to save Mulder, and and their uh, you know silent communication skills really paying off, and just that image of a boa up in the corner, all pasty, you know he's you know he's got no pigmentation because he's not had his pituitary gland fixed for a while. Um, he's up in this corner it's just lit so you can see and scully's on her phone and Mulder's doing his eye movement to try and indicate and she's like what while still talking on the phone i love that scene it's so well shot and i love the fact that scully is called in by the cdc to investigate this case in the the first place and Mulder just turns up at her autopsy bay like scully why aren't you with me i'm missing you what are you working on i want to play with you <laughs> just like poor lost puppy uh it's just like scully why wasn't i invited well conveniently i have some previous cases in the x files that are linked to this so yay we can play together <laughs> I, I i love the dynamic that scully science is what got them involved in this case in the first place essentially uh, and then the CDC are just like, oh, we don't really care. We don't get it. Whatever. <laughs> it's too weird for us. And then, yeah, it turns out, um, I actually think this episode is genuinely creepy. It is unfortunately derivative. It, 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 it feels too samey. Um, it definitely feels like it's trying to be, like I say, Fresh Bones is easily the best uh you know comparison fresh bones and squeeze are, are easily um so it is retreading old ground i i get what it's trying to do i get the awareness it's trying to bring but i feel much like say uh home again with its homeless situation story 
Uh, I feel like it just, it's clunky. Um, but I, I just for atmosphere and what it does, I, I got to put it in A. Because I do enjoy it. You know what, when I see it on the list, I'm always like, mm, okay. If you say so, and then, and then I watch it, and I'm like, actually, I'm really into this. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I got to put it there. Um, so that's three episodes horror episodes but we got a fourth guys here we go with the best one let's be honest uh vince gilligan script in unruh uh or unruh as i call it but i i know it's like uh, i again as i said before with the german not very good with it so unruh uh or something um but i will just keep saying unruh <laughs> for the rest of this um yeah vince gilligan script perfect amazing i'm not even gonna dilly dally i'm gonna talk about it obviously but let's be honest it, it's got to go up in s this is so genuinely chilling to the bone i cannot express how much this anybody who knows me i've said it before i've got anything to do with the brain that makes you not who you are anymore creeps me out and there is nothing that epitomizes that more than lobotomies I can't deal with it. I cannot. The thought of and you know, this was before I saw something like one flew over the cuckoo's nest, uh, or stuff like. I just hate it. Just the thought of it. Um, and you and you even see Scully's absolute disgust when these this woman turns up, um, with uh, she's just wandering around, uh, completely, and she it turns out she's had this or orbital lobotomy. And Scully is just like, oh God, it's done like with an ice pick and, and stuff like that. And she's she's like, oh, it's been done wrong. And she is so horrified. And as this woman is in the scanner, she's like just mumbling. And it's so chilling. And as usual, this, this show is so good with its casting, especially for its antagonists. And, I, and Pruitt Taylor Vince deserves all the praise he gets for his role in this uh because it's so weird because <sighs> schnauz is such uh is such a, a hor what he does is so horrifying and yet he's strangely sympathetic like you just, you feel so you kind of feel bad for him and and there is that possibility that he actually does um does have this ability to see these howlers because as turns up on a lot of lists this episode is cited a lot for the foreshadowing in it for him seeing scully and pointing to him right there which is exactly where she gets her tumor um so either he's mentally ill or he does have that ability we will never know the fact that he's able to affect those uh affect the um photos is never addressed we just move on from that uh i don't know how Mulder doesn't figure out the whole six headstone um you know for the father it takes him that long to figure that one out so much for oxford trained spooky Mulder. um but and, of course, this is another episode that shows Mulder's ability of profiling basically means staring at something for lengths of time. <laughs> but we have Mulder profiling. We have Mulder being upset about Scully getting abducted because Scully does get abducted yet again. But the thing is, is as old as it feels, as frustrating as it is, especially just thinking of the treatment of scully in this show what vince gilligan does that would not be done in lesser hands is he uses the partnership between Mulder and scully and uses her abduction in a way that is important to solving the case that is important to the, the relationship building um and Vince Gilligan doesn't always do it. I mean, Pusher, Mulder was the one in danger. Scully came to the rescue. So he, it's, it's not his trope, if you know what I mean. Uh, it's just so well executed. And her capture 
and her discussions with Jerry. Um, there is an excellent bit. Um, uh, Pruitt Taylor Vince uh, suffers with a condition called nystagmus, which I have as well. And it's used a lot in roles that he has because um, it's a, a rapid eye movement. Uh, it's used a lot to make some of his characters more creepy. And it doesn't get overused here, which I think is brilliant. It get, I think it's uh, utilised for like one scene. Now, I don't know if that's not if that's true or if he's just acting it. But there's this one moment where she's talking on her phone and he stood on these uh, plastering, uh, drywalling um, uh, stilts, which apparently were impossible to work with. Uh, apparently, uh, 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 Taylor Vince had to just stand there for that one scene and then they changed to a stunt double for the, the, the chasing after scene because <laughs> Vince could not move in those stilts at all. Uh, and uh, I think, again, I think this is a... I could be wrong. I think this is a Kim Manners... I'll, I'll put the little description... I'll put the thing up if it's not. I'm pretty sure this was a Kim Manners-directed ep episode. Um, but, yeah, there's this one bit where Scully's uh, turns to him after Mulder has indicated uh, that it's somebody that's tall or trying to be taller, and she turns and stares at Schnell's and he's like looking back and his eyes aren't focusing and they're like darting back and forth. And there's something very like Lukash in season nine's, uh, uh, oh God, 4D? Yeah, my brain's gone. <laughs> the, the episode with Lukash, the creepy asshole. Um, there's something very, and he's just doing this breathing and it just goes silent and his eyes are twitching. And Scully's looking back at him and he's like, what do I do? And then he runs. And it's so tense. And it's so well utilised. Um, he is the perfect casting. Because you do. He's doing awful things. But you can't help but go. Is this guy just ill? Or, or what? Is he trying to help people in the only way that he knows how? Uh, as awful as it is. It is so unsettling. Uh, I love the dynamic between Mulder and Scully. I, I love the whole setup. I love Scully trying to find... She's genuine... She's putting really good scientific explanations for... At the chemists. Uh, she's giving really good... Like, talking about the film stock. Or uh, the camera and stuff. And, and the heater by the film stock that could have made the picture distorted. Uh, and Mulder's like, yeah, alright. What have you say? <laughs> Uh, but at the same time, like, it, it's not stupid what she's suggesting. It's not as frustrating as a lot of her debunking can be. It's not just Scully going, yeah, whatever, Mulder, that's stupid. It's her actually having explanations. And, uh, yeah, such a good script. So well done. So well acted. So well shot. Love it. Always love watching it. Creeps me out genuinely. And it's heartbreaking and uh, the relief you feel when Mulder breaks through that camper van uh, window and opens that door and saves Scully. Uh, only thing I don't think well done is the ADR uh, for Scully when she speaks German. Um, now, we've all seen that Graham Norton clip where Scully, uh, Gillian Anderson read from the German dictionary, not very well. Um, but uh yeah it's 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 really distracting the 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 dubbing uh of the voiceover for the german uh, dialogue uh but otherwise great love it love it love it love it uh can't say anything else um next up we go from one excellent episode oh you're gonna hate me to the field where i died another morgan and wong script I don't like it. I don't. And I know this, this episode gets... I, this is one of those episodes I think gets a lot of love or hate. There's rarely an in-between for it. Um, I just find it very bleh, <laughs> to be honest. And it's not... A lot of people hate this episode because it's like, Oh, you're saying Scully's not Mulder's soulmate. And that's a stupid reason for hating this episode. Because there's plenty of other reasons to hate it. <laughs> not, not, not Kristen Cloak's acting. 
I think she does really well as Melissa uh, Rydal uh, Vizian, this woman with multiple personality disorder, um, which unfortunately is overused in, in stuff. But I think it's well used here. They didn't ever use it again uh, on the show. Uh, so I think, it, you know, you had to have at least one episode that had it. Um, but it's just, you're dealing with this cult. And the main the main hook of the episode is that Mulder, like, died on the field where this cult hangout is. And, and he's drawn to it. And apparently... He is soulmates with Melissa, and he's drawn to her. And you're like, okay. So then the main focus of this episode becomes their regression sessions, where we learn that apparently somehow Smoking Man was in the Gestapo during uh, World War Two somehow. I don't know how the time frame doesn't work there, but whatever. Um, apparently his soul was there as somebody who killed Mulder's, the soul, you know, Mulder's father's soul. Um, and Scully is, oh God, no. Is Scully his father? I can't remember. The, the funniest thing is, is Scully is always like this authority figure in Mulder's uh, lifetimes, which is excellent and and. and kind of funny and and you know he, she's always somebody important in his life and he's way way more devastated in some of these setups that scully has died or scully you know uh, whoever she is in these life that he's going through he looks way more devastated by scully's death than in melissa's deaths and i'm just sat there going wow, for somebody whose wife or, or husband or whatever just died, you look more bothered that your father just died. Uh, <laughs> um, and the whole theme is, oh, souls come back together, and then you have this discussion between Mulder and Scully, which everybody cites, and I... Whatever. I'm sorry. I, I just... This episode... Like, I mean, this whole thing of... If you found out we'd been friends in other lifetimes, would that change the way we see each other? And Scully's like, I wouldn't change your date. Now, that's good. But, like, they're friends anyway. I mean, especially getting to this point, they've become more friends than partners. Um, it just seems odd. And then more odd is Scully's line, except for that fluke man thing. I could have done with that. Scully was barely in the fluke man episode. <laughs> Not... Oh, you know what? I could really have done without that Donny Faster situation. That was awful. Or tombs. No, we have to go for the fluke man thing. And I'm just like, she was barely in the host. Like, she had like one viewing of the monster and that was it. It's just, I, I get it. It's for for recognition's sake and, and stuff like, you know, oh, people will get that. Uh, fluke man, uh, we know that. It's like there are so much more terrifying things that Scully has gone through, you know, that she's actually experienced herself that could have been referenced. And they didn't go for it. And I'm, I'm like, that's a missed opportunity. The fluke man is such an odd choice because she was barely in that episode because of Gillian's uh, pregnancy. Um, and then they had this whole thing where it takes until like two thirds, well, two thirds into the episode, right near the end. Um, after Mulder and Melissa's uh, regression sessions, um, where then Scully finally checks the records for where there might be bunkers on the land. Why has it taken that long? This this ATF team are the worst, and Mulder and Scully are doing all the work while somehow still having these regression sessions. And then at the end, they're like, oh, we don't know where the cult leaders are. Except somehow then the cult leaders are shooting through windows from a building. Why did nobody spot this? This No, no wonder poor Skinner was so frustrated at the beginning where he was like, can you please find something? <laughs> it's just, it, this is the worst. It just, I find this episode frustrating. And the, 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 the monologue at the beginning... It gets repeated twice. 
I get it's going for the cyclical thing and it's very pretty, but watching David Duchovny stood in a field holding photos, pretending to kind of cry, emote, whatever, it's just, it doesn't do it for me. And I get it. If you like this episode, I get it. There's a lot, there's really good performances here. The guy playing Ephesian is super, like, one note, not particularly interesting. Uh, it feels like he's going for that kind of uh, religious persecution thing, but it doesn't pay off. Um, yeah, I just, it just feels very pointless. And I don't, and, you know, it's never mentioned again anyway. Melissa just disappears, she dies. And the whole soul thing, you know, it's just Mulder's sad at the end because she died. And you're just like, okay. But, I mean, he just met her. I know their souls are supposed to be entwined or whatever, but what did he think he was going to do? Immediately jump in bed with the the mentally ill lady? Just, I don't know. I can't deal with this. I never like it. I try. I can sit through it. I don't hate it. Which is why I am going to put The Field Where I Died in C. Because I don't hate it. I just struggle and I skip. And yeah, it's boring. <laughs> I just find it really mediocre. I can't help it. It's, yeah. I certainly, again, I really... Morgan and Wong's episodes this season, uh, except for Home... A real slog. Um, but anyway, moving on from that, we have got Sanguinarium, which is a very odd one because apparently I didn't know this until uh, listening to the Monsters of the Week uh, book um, that this is what they called a spot script, um, where writers, you know, throw out scripts to different shows, uh, see what gets picked up. Um, and this is by uh, Vivian and Valerie Mayhew. Uh, and I, I didn't know it again until hearing this book. But this episode is so, so not liked. I didn't think it was that bad. I actually find it uh, suitably gory. And I love that Mulder the whole way through. You would think that an episode... Again, I think if Chris Carter was in charge that he would have had Scully... Uh, like, examining her, I mean, she, he does it in bloody, uh, you know, in, in season 11. Uh, but, um, <laughs> I think if he was, he'd have Scully, like, uh, considering her body. I think it's funny that they have Mulder, considering his nose, thinking about what he, you know, rhinoplasty and work he could have on his nose. Uh, that's kind of funny. Um, I, I won't lie, this this episode is very gore for gore's sake. Um, but the gore that is here is gross and kind of terrifying. And if, if ever there was anything to put me off having plastic surgery, this episode is it. That image of the laser going through that woman's cheek or the... Uh, um, the uh, oh my God, the liposuction... We're going to just dig in the tool into this person. Oh, it's it's awful. It's it's so gross. It's, 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 you know what? It's kind of very nothing lasts forever. Kind of gross out for grossing sake, but 90s style as, as far as they could push it. Um, yeah, the story is a little lacking and it doesn't make sense because it's just like wicker and it made sense. The show very rarely touched upon Wicca and witchcraft. Um, but it turns out it's this guy that works there. But, and he's benefiting from the blood sacrifices of these patients. But he's not the one doing the killing. He's affecting the doctors that are doing the killing. And then he's reaping the benefits. I'm like, okay. And there's this little nurse who's trying to protect the patients but doesn't just report the guy that she thinks it is. And then she ends up dying via some kind of wick, uh, voodoo uh, kind of curse that ends up with her 
puking up, uh, fill, being filled with needles, um, which is very effectively done. Um, but yeah, the, the story is a little light. There's not much to say about this one. Uh, the story is quite light on the ground. Um, and yeah, it doesn't... There's no real explanation for the wicker. Uh, the explanation of the like the the, the wicker sabbaths and stuff like that. Uh, it just went. Mm, what could we do with witchcraft? And then just bastardized it. Uh, I think there's some good acting here. I love the interactions between Mulder and Scully. As Scully's so dismissive, you know, as a as a medical doctor, she's so disgusted by the the work of these uh, plastic surgeons. She's just like, oh whatever. And Mulder's just like, oh well, you know, everybody wants to look pretty. <laughs> it's just like, okay. I can't help it. I enjoy this episode. I don't know. Maybe I'm just such a fan of horror. Um, but I actually enjoy this episode. I find it suitably creepy. It's sad because stuff doesn't pay off in the end. And again, I feel the story is thin on the ground. Um, but I'm gonna have to. Uh, it's. I get why. If I get why people don't like it, I do. I. I didn't know it was so unliked. I. I think because I'm just usually like wrapped up in how I feel about it. Um. But it's, it's one of those turn your brain off kind of episodes where you're just like, I just want some gore. I want some, you know, Mulder and Scully trying to figure something out. Uh, and it has a very, you know, the Doctor gets away with it. It has a very signs and wonders ending um, where where the guy gets, the Doctor gets away with it and he just carries on with a new face. And you're like, wow, wow, okay, that was pointless. <laughs> and we never hear from him again. So you don't know how long his reign of terror continued. I'm surprised Mulder and Scully didn't get called into this new place at some point. Um, I'm, I can't help it. I'm going to have to put it in B. Um, I just I find it mildly entertaining. <laughs> There's not much else to say about it. Um, Next up, we have Musings of a Cigarette Smoking Man. Another Morgan and Wong script. Well, it's a, a, a Jane, a Glenn Morgan script with James Wong directing. And it tries something very different. It goes through this very vignette style. Uh, you know, going for this story style because we see... We see that. Smoking man, as told by in in what feels like very film noir at times. Um, we hear we we don't know who the the unreliable narrator is here, because we're led to believe it's Fro Hickey telling the story that he's heard from somewhere else, but then we witness a lot of it from Smoking Man's point of view. So is this his interpretation of the story? Because as well, he says uh, this character's line at the end where I could kill you, but not today or whatever, whenever I like, but not today. Um, so I don't know. I'm, I'm not. But anyway, it's an unreliable na narrator. Um, and it's it's in parts. It's set up like a book uh, where you have these little vignettes where you have uh, Chris Owens playing younger smoking man for like a couple of uh, sections where apparently Smoking Man killed JFK and Martin Luther King. Uh, the Martin Luther King section is really disappointing. Uh, it's just him in black and, and it tries. It has this whole lead up with the black and white. It's all shot in black and white, uh, the, the, the Martin Luther King section for some reason. Not the JFK section. And the Martin Luther King section could have been shot in black and white. But for this one section, they went for black and white. Um, and you have these shots of like, oh, take down. And that was very short. And then it moves on to Smoking Man, like uh, played by William B. Davis at the FBI or some government building, listening in as Scully is sent down to the basement and that. And there's this, there's this hope that his book is going to get published so he starts like wearing a nicotine patch and there's all hope but oh 
he submitted to a porn magazine and then got upset when they changed the ending to his story. Oh, boo hoo. I just. I don't like this episode. <laughs> I'm sorry. This episode gets in so many top 10 lists. It is like so much. I get what they were going for. Um, maybe it's just me. William B. Davis in his uh, uh, memoirs uh, book even said that for the longest time he didn't like this episode. Uh, that it was over, trying to over uh, sentimentalize the uh, character. And I get that. I mean, that's the thing. You know, there's a lot of antagonists where giving them a backstory, trying to make you sympathize with them, just does not work. And I think that's the case with this episode. I'm sure there's more depth and analysis to this episode to give it more, you know, to make it more... Under and I do. Sometimes I come to it where I'm just like, I get what they were trying to do, but on this watch-through, I did not get it. On on my original watch-through, I hated it. I've, I've mellowed out with it. I absolutely despised it on my first watching. Um... I just don't like it. It plods. It, it, again, I guess it shows Smoking Man's storytelling, his lying ability that gets used over and over again. Uh, you know, there's, there's section, you know, it's all well shot, uh, showing his, uh, you know, interactions with Lee Harvey Oswald and that. Um, I always love seeing Chris Owens as young Spender, uh, so then to have him as Jeff Spender uh, in season five was really good uh, as the son of Smoking Man. Um, there's a lot of setup, but it just, it, I get why it was done. It was done and, you know, it was done to give uh, Anderson and Duchovny some time off. It was good to have a, a Smoking Man centric episode. Uh, I think as well, a lot, just the essence of the episode is changed by the fact that Morgan and what Glenn Morgan wanted Frohickey to die. He he was adamant about this. This was something apparently there was a big conflict with with Chris Carter, who absolutely refused to let them kill off Frohickey. And they this went on for some time and they were he was so adamant that, you know, uh, he wanted Frohiki to die or one of the gunmen. Um, and then it doesn't happen. And he got changed at like the ninth hour. Uh, and yeah, I think as a result, again, you can feel Morgan and Wong's uh, frustrations of coming back to a show that hadn't really evolved uh, throughout their episodes. But I think this, after this, I think this might have been the breaking point for them. And... Uh, I think you can really feel it. I think I think this episode would have really been more impactful had something like that happened. But as it is, it has no in impact. It's all lies and smoke and mirrors. It's all unreliable narrative, and it just it just plods. I don't like it. I'm sorry. Um, it's not the worst episode. I, I can see why people would enjoy it. Um, depending on, again, everybody takes different things away from this show. So if this is your kind of uh, character examination, then I get why you would like it. But I'm sorry, I'm going to have to put it in C. Um, this is not good when you've got two Morgan and Wong episodes in the same rank. Um, but yeah, I, j I just don't get on with this one. Um, which is sad because we were doing so well. Uh, but at least we're going to go well because we've now got Tunguska, uh, the Tunguska Terma double uh, mythology episodes, which really, oh, just, I've said it before, I love the Black Oil, the Black Oil storyline. Uh, I'm so gutted, as I said for Heronvolk, I call it the Vancouver virus. I'm so gutted that it just got dumped. That they didn't know where else to go with it. After, like, Fight the Future, we had, you know, Vienna but in Season 8. But that was like, oh, yeah, we had this thing. Um, let's try this. Uh, 
I was so annoyed that it just got dumped. We had the crops, you know, in season. There was it had so much build up in season five and fight the future, and then just that was it. <laughs> and the Tunguska uh, Terma double um, is so well done. We have the return of Crycheck, uh, good old Rat Boy, who somehow, somehow, we do not know. More than likely, Smoking Man went back and let him out after a while. Was just like, so, you're going to work for me, right? <laughs> so, so he gets used to, uh, uh, to acquire this diplomatic pouch. Uh, and <laughs> that has the black oil in it. Uh, so Mulder and Scully capture it and stuff like that at this great chase at the the bus station serving as an air, uh, an airport. Uh, <laughs> um, but the thing that we have to take away from this episode easily is my favourite thing. Today, buy your own punch a cry check. I think everybody should have their own pet cry check to beat the shit out of. Not that I condone, you know, violence. But when it comes to cry check, knock yourself out. It's so fun to just constantly mould us hitting the shit out of him. And then he gets taken to Skinner's, Topless Skinner, um, Topless Skinner's place. Um, and beating the shit out and just slapped around constantly. The, my, my main issue with it is that Scully didn't, doesn't get a hit in. This poor woman who who didn't really get to, you know, kill the uh, Louis Cardinal, um, she finally gets to face down the man that killed her sister and then isn't given the chance to get a punch in. How sexist was Fox back in the 90s? <laughs> I know, Dana Scully's above that. Garbage. She shouldn't been. She should have been given the chance to punch the shit out of Crycheck as much as everybody else was. I don't care how manly it makes them look, um, but no, <laughs> it's so it's so constant. He gets he gets held cap. He gets locked up at Skinner's place, and then Mulder takes him and and somehow on his way to to Russia, then finds out that Crycheck he's gonna leave him in the car after being around Marita's. They go for this whole weird thing. Now, her daughter, she, he, Mulder goes to Marita for information and they try for this whole she's going to have sex with him approach. But then we cut to somehow he leaves the, the apartment and gets down to the car in three minutes flat. You're like, oh, okay, I get what you, were, what you were trying to imply and then subvert it. But I'm curious how not only did she get the information for him, but then he got back down to the car in only three minutes. That's <laughs> insane. Um, and it just felt odd. I mean, I get that she's trying to use him and stuff like that. But that whole, she's in her dressing gown and she looks over her shoulder. I'll be back. And you're like, oh my God. <laughs> no, not you as well. Um, but uh, yeah. And then cry there at the airport, and Mulder's just gonna leave him in the car. And he's like, "Oh, you know, if, I, if I'm not back in a week, I'll get Scully to come by and feed you." <laughs> I love it. I love it so much. Poor Crycheck. I mean, not poor Crycheck, because he's an arsehole and he's killed like important people in these, you know, good people's lives. But poor Crycheck. <laughs> But then he randomly, conveniently, starts cursing Mulder in Russian. And Mulder's like, oh, wait, you're Russian? And Crycheck's like, well, yeah, my parents were Russian, uh, you know, immigrants or whatever. And Mulder's like, oh, you're coming with me. And you're like, okay. <laughs> I, um, and then, of course, there it ends with that image. They get captured and imprisoned and you know we find out the russians are working on this vaccine for the black oil um and that image at the end of mold under the chicken wire uh and then infected with a black oil is terrifying that that to be continued was the most horrific thing i had seen up to that point um so you've got that side but then you've got 
Adventures of Scully and Pendrel. Oh, it's so beautiful. They would have made such beautiful babies. I don't care how much I ship Mulder and Scully. Scully and Pendrel is just adorable. <laughs> Poor Pendrel. We should have known. We should have known that he was doomed because of how much uh, you, uh, he got out of this season before being killed. Um, yeah, for some reason, even though, even though Pendrel is a Psycrime Lab... Uh, tech and not anything remotely uh, CDC related or that. He's working with Scully to investigate when this doctor gets infected by the black oil via a hazmat suit. And I just love their adventures of trying to investigate this, uh, the, the, what the rock is and what the oil is and what's happened to this, to this guy. Um, and then, but the problem is with this episode is it starts out with the whole, oh, oh, Scully in Congress giving a speech and, and, and she's, uh, uh, she's in, at risk of being held in contempt of Congress if she doesn't tell them where Mulder is. And then that's the end of the teaser, like, is she going to, and then the payoff is, no, she just goes to prison for a bit <laughs> when it catches up in Terma. And you're just like, oh, that was the payoff? We just And you have to sit through this scene twice. This season is bad for this uh, uh, midi-res uh, situation where they show you a, a scene and then go 24 or whatever hours earlier. And then you watch up and, and then they show you the same scene again. This happens like on three occasions in this season. Uh... And, you know, overflowing into the Redux, uh, you know, trilogy. Um, it's just... And it's not a particularly interesting scene. The most interesting bit is when uh, Mulder turns up. Uh, when she goes back to, to, to continue her testimony. Um, yeah, the, the whole Congress uh, stuff I, I wasn't particularly interested in. But what I did like was the scenes between Smoking Man and Well Manicured Man. John Neville and William B. Davis play off each other so well and it's so good to see the workings of because we see you know the, the the syndicate together in this this building this smoky room and they just talk amongst themselves but here we have proper interactions where we see what's going on and and you see the stuff with like uh, Manic Man is like, turns out he's sleeping with this Dr. Kansaya and stuff like that. And, and Smoking Man is like, you're sleeping with her, aren't you? I think he's just jealous, really. Um, you wouldn't you wouldn't put the project at risk, would you? And, and Manic Man is just like, shut up. <laughs> it's a shame we didn't get more of Well Manicured Man. But watching the interactions between them and, and how they're manipulating the, the game... And then when they find out, you know, Mulder's in Tunguska and, and stuff like that. Uh, there is so much intrigue here. Uh, and there's so much build up. Because the thing is, is when I think of this episode, when I think of Tunguska, I think of it as like the setup, And then I always feel like Terma is the, the, the weak payoff. But actually, I, I rewatched it for and there's so much to feed over because you have the lead up of... So Tunguska, I'm going to put in... I don't think it's perfect. I've watched this double a lot. I think it's really well acted, uh, really well directed. There's a lot of good uh, action. The chase scenes with the horses after Mulder and Crycheck uh, are really thrilling. Um, so I'm gonna, but I ha it does plot at times. Uh, I am kind of torn. I kind of really want to put. I kind of want to put it up in S. Uh, I'm going to put it in A. Because I think the problem is, is I have to think of this as the two-parter. Uh, and unfortunately... Maybe I could put Tonga Scrub in S. See, here's the thing. I like Terma. Terma is a good continuation of the story. Unlike Heron Volk, it is still part of that story. It's not trying. It, it's not trying something different. At the same time, it is because then we have the whole story of 
Vasily Peskov or whatever he is. This Russian former CGB, uh, CGB, um, former uh, 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 Russian uh, spy um, who is going around old people's homes. This whole thing with the assisted uh, death thing in the teaser of Terma is so weird. You just finished on a to be continued of Mulder under chicken wire infected by the black oil and you come to Terma the following week and it's some old people's home with this guy killing the people like using this stuff to kill people off and you're like okay and we don't really get we see Mulder wake up after and we don't really get any insight really on how on his thoughts on the being infected by the black oil and also my answer my question is so they're doing these tests on the people to try and like make the vaccine how do they get the vet the, the black oil to just leave without killing the people like do they just go to the black oil Excuse me, would you awfully mind uh, leaving the body now? We're, we, we're done with our tests for the day. We don't want to kill off the subjects. Um, it's really weird. I don't know. I, I, I can't imagine this alien virus just being cool. Like, just like, yeah, you know what? I'm bored of this body. It's trapped under a wire. I can't go anywhere. I can't do anything. So I'm going to leave. Um, but we never get any real feeling for how Mulder felt infected by the black oil or how he was affected. He's a little groggy from the drugs, but that's about it. Um, so, yeah, I think I think there could have been a lot more there. Uh, the concentration camp style uh, imagery is really horrific and terrifying. And to think of Mulder stuck in that situation is really tense because you're like, how is he going to get out of this? And the way to get out of it is to beat the shit out of Krychek. ta -da! <laughs> Beating Krychek just pays off every time. This should be the lesson of the show. <laughs> um, yeah, it's really tense. Especially then when you see these guys and the answer is to, you know, no tests. No, no arm, no tests. Uh, and you're like, how is Mulder going to get out of this situation? Uh, Krychek himself, who's escaped from Mulder's uh, uh, thing, has uh, found himself caught up with some escapees who have chopped off their arms and they very kindly help Krychek by chopping his arm off again. Krychek abuse wins every time. Ding! There should be a message, you know. Krychek, Krychek abuse approved. Uh, <laughs> It's just, wow, it's just insane. Poor poor Nick Lee, the things he must have had to have gone through to film some of these scenes. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, just, I feel like, again, so we have, I don't like the, the, the Peskov storyline where he's going up, cleaning up all the, the stuff where we find out at the end that he was in contact with Krychek the whole time and Krychek was probably telling him what to do. Um... And he's going around, he's killing these old people where these tests were being done. He kills the doctor that got infected at the CDC. Uh, and he's just going around and and then he get he manages to get the rock from the CDC with the black oil in. And he takes it up to the nebulous Canada, complete with a checkpoint that we see. <laughs> the most lax checkpoint, by the way. Um... He just goes to random Canada and somehow Mulder and Scully track down where he was. I know they were looking, they did order a, a search of the truck, you know, for a truck that had been stolen. But they managed to just track him down somehow in 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 the, the very tiny area of Canada, apparently. Um, and it's so tense where you see Mulder trying to get this uh, rock out before the bomb goes off. Uh, and poor Scully is like elsewhere and then she, uh, you know, Peskov takes her aside and is like, I just want to finish my job and then, and she's watching as this blows up and she's running to where Mulder is and she's like, Mulder! You hear the absolute fear in her voice as she sees him covered in black oil and that. 
Um, I I love that scene. I love the scene in Congress, obviously, where Mulder comes in, and and then how quickly Scully turns to him, and uh, you know, it's like Mulder, and she and he's like, oh, I get to put my arms around you, both of them. Uh, it's and right in front of their boss, just no no qualms about just hugging in front of their boss, and and even just Scully's integrity. She's going again. She says she does. She's not inclined to go with her gut on. You know, she should. She should believe that these congressmen uh, are good people and trying to do the right thing. But she's not inclined to go with that. And Skinner's just like, so you're gonna go with Mulder's inclination instead? And she's like, she's struggling. She can't say it. She can't admit it. She doesn't want to, but she is. Um. Because she knows something's not right. And, yeah, even though it goes against everything, you know, and, it, and it's true. We turn, we find out, this is it Sorensen or whatever? It is uh, working with a uh, smoking man. Um, but, yeah, it's, I don't know. Terma is an odd one. I just feel like there's a lot of gumph here trying to clear the, the the way so things can go back to normal because that's what you need in a show that is not uh you know that is not uh serialized or that um yeah it i just felt the stuff with peskov was a bit off and then we find out that crycheck's working with him but again that never goes anywhere ever uh which is frustrating um, but as I, I watch this a lot on the, the, the duo, uh, the two episode VHS a lot, uh, cause I really enjoyed it. Um, but I do feel like Terma brings the, the, there's a lot of excellent stuff in Terma. Um, but I feel like the pacing is a little off at times. Um, and yeah, I just, I don't know. I just feel like it brings it down. So that's why I'm going to put it at A. Uh, alongside uh, Tunguska because I think they have to be you can't not put them together <laughs> but they are excellent and enjoyable and again I think a lot of this is sadness that the, the black oil doesn't really I mean it doesn't really get much more this season um, but it was so bigged up and then just killed off uh, so uh, but for groundwork creepy as all hell uh, the, the the prison is terrifying and really tense regarding that to be continued. Um, yeah, a lot of good acting, a lot of good directing um, and just really enjoyable and a good myth arc episode, uh, double episode. Um, next up, we have got Paper Hearts. Another excellent episode brought to us by Vince Gilligan because... What other type of episode would be brought to us by Vince McGilligan? Um, this is an interesting, uh, tense, dramatic episode uh, focusing on a, uh, a, a paedophile criminal, um, John Lee Roche from Mulder's past, somebody Mulder captured back in the day. Uh, much like, say, the likes of Barnett from Young at Heart or Luva Lee Boggs from Beyond the Sea. We've not really had much from Mulder's past since season one to catch up with him. So it's fun uh, at this point to, to go back to one of these old cases of his that comes back to haunt him. Uh, but they add this parallel, uh, paranormal, parallel, they add this paranormal element by saying that apparently somehow Roche found a way to essentially infect Mulder's dreams uh, by uh, then taunting Mulder, uh, by leading him to, with, with, apparently Puppy turns into a kitty this episode, and uh, by making Mulder in his dreams chase after this laser pointer that it's going like uh, Alice in Wonderland. The whole theme is Alice in Wonderland this episode. Um, follow me, you know, stuff like that. So Roche leads uh, Mulder to the, the, the victim, his victims, the bodies of his victims, who are these little girls. Um which then he ties into uh, Mulder's sister. Uh, so 
Yeah, it, it, it involves Mulder going to the prison, interrogating Roche to because they find this body. Uh, Mulder finds this body that he's been led to in his dreams, and he doesn't understand. He's trying to piece together how, like, maybe there's this subconscious that had worked it out, or his brain had all, always been trying to work out because these bodies were never found. Um, so yeah, he, he he finds this victim, and then he goes into uh, question Roach. And we have this excellent scene. Apparently this season just wants to show off David Duchovny's uh, sportsman prowess. Um, because we have this scene where uh, Roche is playing basketball and Mulder goes in and Roche is like, if you can sink that, I'll, I'll talk to you. And uh, now Vince Gilligan says he wasn't there on the day of shooting. Um, but apparently Duchovny got the ball in the hoop first try. Um, so, yeah, we have this episode showing off his basketball skills and then Elegy showing off his uh, bowling uh, with a strike. So, uh, yeah, it seems to be a running theme in this show, so especially this season. Um, but, yeah, it's it's fun to watch the dynamic. Oh, just Tom Noonan, as I said, this show is always good, usually, um, for especially in the Vince Gilligan episodes, for casting its antagonists. And Tom Noonan as Roach is just the right level of creepy, slimy, scummy, manipulative. Oh, it's so frustratingly good. Because uh, you just hate this guy. And, yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting to see Mulder, especially then when Samantha, the possibility is seeded in that maybe Roche took... Samantha and you know the whole alien thing abduction thing was just Mulder's brain trying to deal with it um so we don't see Mulder it's it's nice to see that apparently uh Mar Mulder is alive uh we did get we I didn't mention it at the time in Unruh there was supposed to be uh, an opening scene where Scully uh asked Mulder how his mother is doing and he's like oh doctors have said this and we get an update except that scene was cut now apparently it was cut for time but i think it was cut because originally unruh was going to be episode two i think it was uh, it was certainly second in the production line but it got moved back a couple of episodes um so i guess it wouldn't have made much sense several episodes after Heronvolk to then have this question it's because a lot of people wouldn't know what was going on um but yeah no we've not heard anything about marmolda since the end of uh Heronvolk. and yes we know the alien bounty hunter you know uh healed her and that but we've not heard anything and there's not been any reference to her development um so, it, yeah, it's nice to see that she's still alive. Mulder goes round to, to kind of corroborate or deny Roche's story about being a uh, vacuum cleaner salesman who apparently sold to the Mulders. Um, so Mulder goes round to ask his mum and find out about this Hoover that for some reason, despite moving house, she has kept... I mean, she could sell that shit on eBay. Vintage vacuum. <laughs> she just randomly got it buried down in her basement it's so random um i always have to laugh when it's just like have you, have you got this vacuum for like 40 years ago it's like okay um but yeah no it's interesting to see the the back and forth between these two adversaries and then scully watching and you know we've seen before how she hates seeing Mulder as he slips into profiler mode. Um, there's really not much profiling going on here because it feels like Roche is the one doing, you know, Mulder's not really punching that many holes. He feels like emotionally he's just too entrenched to be profiling. So he's not really putting many holes in Roche's story. Scully is the one going, yeah, right. Um, I love the scene where Mulder punches Roche and uh, the guard is like, oh, I didn't see anything. And Scully stood there like, 
I did. But then when they go to Skinner and Skinner's like, oh, you know, you punched an inmate. Mulder turns to Scully quite faringly, to be fair, fairly accusatory. But Skinner's like, no, Scully didn't tell me, even though she should have. There's video footage. Um, and I just love, though, when, when Scully sat there for the interrogation with Roach and, you know, he makes, he does something to be a dick to Mulder. And Scully's just like, oh, God, just you could hear her frustration. It's so heartbreaking how much she's like she hates seeing Mulder being manipulated and treated like this. Vince Gilligan has always been good with his, like I said it in Unruh. He's always been good with using the partnership as an emotional way to give. De Sorry, I didn't mean to make knock the mic to give an emotional depth to these characters. Uh, and I don't think it's, you know, shown any better than it is here uh you know we have this ten there i am a bit like the paranormal element is a little too tenuous and feels a bit odd you know we i mean it made sense with like bogs and that and you know you didn't know if he really had this uh psychic ability or stuff like that but the idea that roche was just sat there and somehow found a way into Mulder's dreams is okay. Um, we do get to see uh, possibly the start of Vince Gilligan's obsession with El Caminos uh, because Roche's car was an El Camino. Um, so yeah, it's funny to go back and, and you're like, oh, oh yeah. <laughs> it's not just in Breaking Bad and that. Uh, and I met Tom Noonan at a convention and he said that at some point there were actual talks to do a, another episode, um, you know, prequel kind of thing. And I'm, I'm kind of gutted we didn't get that because I think it would have been really fun to go back to Mulder's profiling days. Um, yeah, we, we don't really get it in, say, Travellers. That's a whole other issue for next episode, uh, next season. Um, but... Yeah, it would have been fun to have... Like, we got those flashbacks to court scenes in, in Young at Heart. But I think it would have been cool to have an episode that showed Mulder's profiling capturing Roach. I think that could have been really tense and creepy. And just the subject, obviously, of this paedophile uh, being taken down. I think it could have been really uh, heart-pounded on that. But at the same time... Um, and even if you're not talking, sorry, even if you're not talking about prequel, even if you're thinking of like a sequel where mold, I, I, uh, Noonan didn't say anything about what the ideas that were floating about. Um, but even if you're talking like a, a sequel, because obviously it, it ends with a very open thing where there's these two fabric hearts that are, you know, two other victims. Uh, and it's just like, is it two hearts or one? Yeah anyway we don't know you know where these bodies are uh there's no closure for that and, and scully's like you'll find them you know you and they never do uh and that's kind of upset i i wish they had been some conclusion to that uh i love scully's you know message of hope and, and supportiveness at the end it's so sweet um but even if you're thinking of like a sequel i just the problem is with say the prequel idea especially is again this show it keeps trying to add paranormal elements to stories that otherwise stand absolutely fine on their own you know irresistible oh the whole point is that the monster can just be the normal looking guy down the street but then they try and they try to add this thing with you know the whole faster as this demon thing uh and it made sense in saying irresistible where it's you know, Scully has seen the face of evil or something, but then they pushed it a bit too far in, say, uh, you know, the follow-up episode, um, Arison. But, uh, yeah, I, I think they, obviously there would have been no, the whole idea is that Roche's time in prison has been spent on this finding, you know, making this connection. So, yeah, I don't know how that would have worked. But at the same time, I would have liked to have seen more of his character. He's just so frustrating uh in his evilness and manipulativeness this is well paced well written well acted 
Uh, and yeah, like I say, it just gives them so much character depth. Uh, I love it. It's it's not shallow at all. I, I enjoy it every time. It is a bit of an emotional roller coaster. I mean, that scene of Mulder digging and Scully's like, Mulder, you're, you know, let the evidence team do that. And he's like, Scully, help me. And she drops to her knees immediately. No qualms whatsoever. Uh, that sounds way ruder than I meant it to, but you know what I mean, and don't make it any ruder than it is. Um, but, yeah, no, just, it's emotion. This, this is a good episode, uh, a brilliant episode. Good just doesn't cover it. Uh, and without question, it has to go in S. Um, I definitely recommend. It's, it's up there in those top tier uh, episodes, which is why I put it in S. Sorry, that was such a... Oh pointless line sorry um anyway next up we have got el mundo gira um this is an episode i will absolutely admit this is an episode when i see it in the list i will just go no nah, no no not really but every time i don't know why i just forget it every time every time i watch this episode i really enjoy it it's uh brought to us by uh, john shyburn and it's it's done in this uh it's like a telenovela story um covering like how these uh, mexican communities either side of the border are passing along the story of el chupacabra um the goat sucker um who is actually uh Eladio buente played by Raymond Cruz in a much more subtle role than, say, Tuco Salamanca from Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul. Um, he, uh, Buente, he, he's in love with his brother's girlfriend, Taylor's oldest time, um, but there's a meteorite crash or some other fortian event, I can't remember what it is, um, and Maria dies. And... His brother Soledad, who's going off to, you know, to, to you know, uh, go across, you know, to work kind of thing. Um, he He's pretty convinced that his brother is uh, responsible because he he saw the looks between Maria and Eladio. So then it becomes brother v brother. Um, so you've got this whole thing where Eladio, who at the point of this meteorite, uh, somehow, I don't know if it was something that was dormant in him that then became uh, activated by the meteorite or what, but he's got this gross enzyme, uh, this enzyme in his BO or something that kills people. It you know anywhere near him, and they they die to this yellow gross uh substance that then like completely eats at their skin and everything um it's really gross the effects are but i'm <laughs> sorry just you can't help but laugh about this idea of this this poor guy who's going around with this dangerous bo you're like wow um and again you're like is he slightly racist <laughs> to say a me sweaty mexican is dangerous um but I actually feel like this this episode doesn't feel preachy regarding its, you know, uh, uh, foreign community kind of thing. Because it feels like it's their story to tell. They're, they're all telling the stories and in, interpreting it their own way. Um, and you've got, you've got, so you've got, Scully is doing the science thing, of course. She's investigating this substance. Uh, she's trying to make sense of this fast acting agent um you've got Mulder who is off on a buddy cop trip with this uh Lorenzo guy from like the immigration like I saw or something uh I can't remember what but he's got a cool hat so you know immediately he's awesome um but I love the dynamic in this buddy cop trip as like Lorenzo Mulder's like I think that the uh, you know, it's the El Chubacabra and, and Lorenzo's just like, oh, please, that's a folk tale. Um, and it's just fun to watch them as they're trying to track down Buente and, and stop. He's not doing anything. He's like trying to just get work and, and, and move on. He's hurting from the death of his girlfriend and that. 
uh it's just a fun episode it's sad it's very melancholic um but i just love the way it's told i don't know what it is there's just something really enjoyable about it um and just yeah i can't i don't know what to say it's just well acted um and yeah it, it, it just i can't explain it my brain has just gone blank sorry <laughs> I'm like, what do I say about this episode? It's just fun to watch his plight. My biggest issue with this episode, though, is so you have, because Lorenzo is totally all for the idea of brother v brother. He wants a smackdown between Soledad and Eladio. Like, he's like, let's capture Eladio and then just let them face each other. You're like, wow, you are like the worst law enforcement ever, but okay. But again, cool hat so we'll, we'll give him the benefit of the doubt um but yeah like it's just like there are people dying dude but my biggest issue is so then brother v brother becomes brother love brother and they go on the run back to they want to get back to mexico but the last shot is of them with gray bumpy heads it takes the the, 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 the like the whole alien as in foreign to the country and alien as in <laughs> spaceship style alien little too on the nose it, it was good at first but then they have this shot of the two brothers walking along apparently nobody reports seeing these two guys with massive gray bumpy heads I, I get the whole like again much like say with teleco Mulder's like, nobody notices what's going on here and stuff like that. Nobody notices them. They just blend into the background. And you're just like, okay, but there's two people walking around looking like aliens. Somebody report that. <laughs> and when they go back to Mexico, what, do people stop dying or what? We just never find out. There's no con real conclusion. Um, I know that's not the message of the story and all that stuff, but yeah, I just, I was just like, it feels like a bit of a cop out at the end. Um, it's a good episode. I know, and like I say, I don't always think of it as a good episode. And I think that is because it's not perfect by any means. Uh, but I just love the presentation of it. I, I love the idea. You're like, again, it's a much better version of the unreliable narrator that we had in Same Musings. Um, I just, I enjoy it. But I do feel it's a little uh, plods at times. And I don't always feel necessarily that we get much depth to um, Eladio. Much beyond the whole... Oh, I loved her so much. You know, Maria, Maria. <laughs> um, yeah, it's just... I, I, I'm I, going to put it in A. Because I don't think it's bad at all. I actually genuinely enjoyed it. Um, and I think it's worth checking out. Especially if it is one that, like me, you skip it um, a lot. So, uh, yeah, there, there's that. Uh, now, next up would have been Leonard Betts. But we are at the halfway point, and I want to leave the cancer arc to its own half, because I think there's a lot there to say, and I don't want to start and be making references to stuff that, you know, is in this part as opposed to... Anyway, basically, so, Kaddish, in production number, is number 12. So I think this is an ideal time to put it, especially because... So it was 12 in the production line. But it was moved to the 15th place uh, for a number of reasons, um, just to make things work better. And I think as well, and it's ideal, I'm, the reason why I'm going to do it now as well is because it shares a lot in common with El Mundo Jira. It is about persecuted people and it's a love story at its heart. Uh, it tells a tale of um, Isaac Luria who uh, a Jewish man who is beaten to death by uh, these uh, guys that are working with this uh, asshole fascist Nazi asshole. <laughs> um, so, yeah, they beat this uh, Isaac to death. And then uh, 
his fiance's dad uh, basically uh, creates a like a golem, um, uh, uh, a, this soil form from the the soil from the the, the gravesite of Isaac, hoping that because uh, he'd made this ring back in like concentration camps. Uh, in hopes that his daughter would um, one day, uh, you know, that he could pass it on. And there was this whole plan for the wedding and then Isaac gets killed. So he brings uh, Isaac back, um, you know, for his daughter, um, Ariel. I have issues with that. I mean, if it had worked the way he'd wanted, like, would she have had sex with a soil man? just maybe i'm putting way too i mean i am let's be honest it's me um i'm putting way too much thought into that but um yes yeah, a little odd um but it doesn't work uh how he would have liked uh because instead of coming back as somebody as uh you know this person driven by love for ariel isaac comes back as somebody with severe hatred um you know, revenge, basically, against the people that killed him. Uh, so these teens start turning up dead, which is how Mulder and Scully get involved. Um, and, yeah, it's... This is an odd story in that it's a little shallow on the ground. Like, it's a deep... Like, it's... It's matter. It's, you know, story matter is, is deep and dark. But... Generally, the way it's presented is just like, our son, our, our son neo Nazis. There are other words I could use to describe the neo Nazis, but you know, I'm gonna try and not swear too much. Um, neo Nazis versus, uh, you know, the Jewish community. You know, that's a, a, a bad enough, you know, showing the persecution there and the stupidity that's being spouted. Um, but at the same time, this is mainly just. A love story and just seeing the mourning and grief uh, of Ariel because um, she doesn't know what's going on she's been led to she's like no Isaac's dead and I'm trying to deal with that can you leave me alone and Mulder and Scully are like we think Isaac might be well I mean let's be honest it's mainly Mulder um Isaac's uh, Mulder's there like I think it's Isaac we have footage showing that Isaac's alive and she's like no he's dead leave me alone um so yeah, it's it's kind of heartbreaking, um, and it's it is an emotional, but it's beautifully presented. They have these wonderful shots of like the synagogue and stuff. Uh, excellent direction as usual by Kim Manners. Um, it's just it's it's beautifully presented, and I I love it as a story, but I do feel it's a little bare bones at times, and I feel it has this weird obsession by trying to dwell on whether Mulder's Jewish or not um now David Duchovny always said that he played Mulder as Jewish which I never got <laughs> I was just like okay now fair I you know I don't know much about the Jewish faith and stuff like that um but I never got where that came from like we were always given the impression that Mulder was this person who hated religion and we never really got to know any of his family enough i mean what do we know we know bill Mulder was working with smoking man and we know that ma Mulder was a, a, a slutty <laughs> she slept with csm um and whenever she's on screen she cries i mean that's pretty much the depth we have to the Mulder family um so we never know if you watch read fan fiction there are all these stories of which one of them was jewish and stuff like that um but yeah for whatever reason there's this guy that they go to the specialist um to find out about this book that the uh that they find in isaac's grave that then catches fire uh and and this guy that I don't remember the name of, sorry, he's explaining and he's like, it's Amet, you know, this is what he reads and stuff like that. And he's looking to Mulder as if, and Mulder's like, I don't speak Hebrew. And the guy's like, oh. And just everybody, like even the, the, the fascist git is like, oh, you're one of them, aren't they? Just because, you know, obviously David's nose and stuff like that. And But this episode just feels this need to keep making that connection and everybody's like, what? And you're just like, 
okay, like, I get it, but, and we never get any confirmation either way or the other. Just we know Mulder doesn't speak Hebrew, um, and that's it. Uh, it doesn't commit to either answer. So, um, you know, it would have maybe been nice to have, like, Mulder make a reference about his family being Jewish or whatever. Um, but we never get that. And that's not important at the end of the day. But it would have added a layer to the character kind of thing if there had been some confirmation. Um, I actually really enjoyed this episode. I can't explain it. There's not much about it to talk about. There's not much... Like I say, it's just... I think it's fascinating to talk about just the the revenge, hate, you know, love kind of story. But um, I think it's, I just feel it's very bare bones. But I am. Uh, I enjoy it enough that I am going to put it, um, I'm going to put it in A. Yeah, I'm going to put it in A. Because I do enjoy it that much. Uh, as silly as it is, it's one of those episodes that you just look at the name of and you're like, eh. But, you know, Kaddish is... Or Kaddish? Is it Kaddish or Kaddish? I don't know. I always just call it Kaddish. So if it's Kaddish, I apologise. Um, but, you yeah, know, I just... I always find it's one that I enjoy. I can't explain it. it it's weird. I'd, I'd love to know other people's thoughts on it. But, yeah, I can see why they would move it a little further away from El Mundo Jura because they're just a little close together uh, in uh, themes. Um, but that's the first 12 episodes of the season. Uh, thanks so much for watching, guys. I am so, so sorry that it has taken over a year to finally get this done. Uh, as I said before in my characters tier list, uh, what happened was I recorded the whole thing through, didn't realise until editing that the top of my head had been cut off the whole time. Uh, so then I recorded straight away uh, the whole thing again. This is early hours of the morning. Uh, recorded again, only to then find out that Audacity had decided to stop recording right at the beginning uh, because I think the cable had come out of the microphone or something. Uh, so yeah that was a bust and i did edit the video together because i still had the audio from my camcorder but i wasn't happy uh one i wasn't happy with the quality of the audio because you know you had standard high high end uh hiss and uh i'd, I'd forgotten to talk about a lot of stuff I, I tried doing inserts to add stuff it just didn't run smoothly and the video was very long uh, it came to about 2 hours 12 minutes. Uh, so I became very conscious this time around uh, to try and keep things moving and, and keep shorter and not babble so much. Unfortunately, as a result, I don't feel as if I've been very thorough this uh, video. So I apologise for that. Uh, I had a serious head injury a couple days ago. Uh, I'm feeling a lot better. Still in a lot of pain. Um, but I am still feeling a bit lightheaded um so i might might not have been as succinct as i would have liked to have been uh hopefully and also it's been over a year since i made one of these videos i mean besides the characters the characters one was a throwaway april fool's joke um that i didn't need to be serious about even though i put way too much thought into it uh this time yeah i i, I was just getting into that mood that that routine of what to say about stuff uh, and remembering it, because although I've watched these episodes many, many times before, it, it, I do feel like it helps to have it fresh in my memory, uh, and it's been over a year since I rewatched these, so, uh, yeah, I, <laughs> I apologise if this video is not to normal standard, uh, hopefully next half will be a little better, a lot better, hope, I'm hoping, uh, but thank you so much for watching, guys, Please share your thoughts. Uh, I really enjoy seeing your comments. I know I'm not always good at replying. That's just a more visual issue uh, of reading the text and then being able to see to, to, to type back. Um, I am trying to get better at that. So please bear with me. Uh, but yeah, please share your thoughts. Share your favourite episodes. I know I'm probably going to get a lot, a lot of hatred for some of these episodes. Um... But I can only tell you how I feel about them. Uh, and especially on this rewatch. 
Uh, I can talk about how I felt back in the day or whatever, but I'm getting old. And when I first watched these, it was a long, long time ago. Uh, the memory is not as good as it used to be. So uh, I can only talk from from like my most modern uh, 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 rewatch. Um, but yeah, please share your thoughts. And uh, link will be in the description to the tier template that I've used on Tier Master. Uh, so you can make your own uh, tiers. I'd like to see screenshots if, if you're if you're making them. Um, I don't know, post them at me at Twitter on Twitter and stuff like that. Uh, or uh, yeah, uh, a link will also be in the description either straight away or next week when it goes live uh, for the second half. Um, I might put the link in for the original version of this uh, with the original audio. Um, in case you're curious, I don't know. I don't know if I'll delete it or not, but, you know, it's not taking up my space. <laughs> I don't care, I guess, if it's uh, taking up YouTube space. But, um, yeah, the link might be there. But, yeah, please share your thoughts, and I will see you in the next half. Hopefully, next week, if not sooner. Uh, take care, guys. Happy 10.13. I've worked. I've been trying to rush to get this out to make sure it's out on time. Uh... I should have recorded a lot sooner, but uh, hopefully, yeah, it should be out on time. So, happy 10.13, uh, Mulder's birthday, and uh, I'll see you somewhere down the line. Take care, guys.